Life Audio. Today on Talk About That, John discovers the subtle difference between prison inmates and referees and unveils a new jingle candidate for his Quote of the Week segment. Meanwhile, I ponder whether ancient philosophers would have been discouraged if they'd put their ideas on Facebook, and I tell the story of Oprah Winfrey and a wheelbarrow full of fat, plus a conversation about what liberty really looks like versus what we think it is. Today's episode is not sponsored by airplane pillows, when you want to sleep on a flight but also want to walk around with a neck brace all day. Johnny, the long wait is over. Finally, another episode I'll talk about that. Is it that long? It's just a week. Yeah, it was only a week, but it feels like a lot longer. When what do you always say? You got to go away, so we miss you, Johnny. I think that I think the listeners missed us a lot. Um, that week felt like at least ten days, probably. Girl, don't go away, mad girl. Just go away. That was a Motley Crue song. <laughs> I should I shouldn't know that, Johnny. You know everything. Motley Crue. Motley Crue was on the list of do not listen to when I was growing up. I don't know about you. Yeah. What was your, did your mom have her certain like, I've heard about that secular music and you're not going to listen to this particular, like I, what I, was the, I don't she think, didn't have any hot button? No. You no. weren't given free reign? I just, that's I why know. you're, that's why you're no good running wild now. I know. I think I policed myself oh, okay. pretty well, but at the same time. I don't know. It's like Laura and I will listen to 90s music like we say before. And it's yeah. like, oh, wow, there's I understand now a lot more of what is being said. Like then it was just kind of oh, like, sure. oh, don't know what that means, but I like the beat. You know, it's like, <sighs> That's how they get you, John. It's that beat. And look at what it's turned me into, Johnny. I don't like it. I don't like it. Either. I don't like what I see yeah. so far. Not today. Uh, you just got off the road like a long trip. Yeah, I did six days. Um Sounds like I'm in jail. I did six days. Johnny did six days and uh, got now, on parole. Now I'm doing community service yeah. on the side of the road. They still do that? They still make people pick up trash? Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I wonder how long. You think that's a think that's a going away thing? Because it's like, a does it take away the person's dignity or whatever? Like, what are we doing there? Are you kidding? Like, I've written books for, I wrote a book for a guy who did a lot of time in prison. Yeah. And... They were so excited to get outside and sure. do the work program. So if they're yeah. doing stuff, so I don't know that I'm not speaking for the entire incarcerated population. I'm just saying uh, that okay. particular guy was like, yeah, Thank I would you rather, for that. Thank you for that caveat. I'd rather be outside than inside. So appreciate that disclaimer. John think, does not represent the views of every incarcerated person. Yeah, sorry guys. I do think that what the people I see are often like, uh, I think that's their traffic school too. Like they may be in trouble, but they're, that's part of their community service or oh. whatever. And they may not be incarcerated, but like, right. You got in trouble. And but you got to put on the outfit. Well, at least a vest. Oh no. I've seen like full on oh, yeah. striped jammies. Those are people that are in jail though. You can usually tell if there's a sheriff's van. They look like the guy in the uh, Monopoly board with the striped. Yeah. Yeah. It's full on. I wish they, I mean. You want to bring that back? Yeah. I wonder why they took it away. I guess orange is easier to see. And if it's. Vertical stripes, it's your referee. I wonder how they decided that. Verticals, referee, horizontal, jail. Wouldn't it be weird if you're a referee? No, they were vertical on jail. No, they were striped going this way. I don't think so, Johnny. Yeah, look it up. Um, Prison stripes are going uh, horizontal. I think everything you just said. Ref stripes are vertical. um, Uh, If you're a ref and you kill somebody, it'd be a weird thing. You just flip the stripes. You just... uh, Prison striped you know Johnny, you're right. They're I think horizontal. it's you know what it is? It's because you're behind the bars and it makes a nice plaid pattern. If you stand up next to the you know what I'm saying? You got the horizontal and the vertical meeting. Like, uh, oh that's kinda look yeah. at this guy. It's a visual. Then the guards play tic tac toe. Oh wow. Well. It's a lot of spaces. It is. Yeah. It's, it's a very complicated version. It's <laughs> it's Sudoku. Sudoku. What is it? Sudoku? Do you ever play that? No. Do you know that it's a thing? I do. Does your mom do it? My dad used to do it. I don't understand it. It just feels like they're just writing random numbers down. My dad showed me it's one like a, time. It's like a math puzzle, right? Yeah, my dad showed me one time, and I was like, oh, that's cool. He probably thought you'd be into it because you're a math guy. Yeah. There's a lot of things I should be into. You probably felt like it was time waster for you, though. You were like, I don't have time to sit down and write these arbitrary numbers. I'm writing bestsellers. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you heard of them. Uh, you probably haven't. No, you know, it's funny because right now I'm in a little bit of a mm-hmm. overwhelming writing moment, which is which I'm starting to get used to again. It'd been a minute since I'd had that. These are good problems to have, John. They are. But I've realized, like, I have all these these, like, visions of 
self-improvement in my head. Uh-huh. Like if you've ever read, that's the worst version of "Twas the Night Before Christmas." <laughs> well, visions of self improvement <laughs> and danced, danced in their, in their heads. heads. Yeah, I like if I read, I read C.S. Lewis's. Um, well, there's an anthology with a lot of his yeah. like, notes and letters and stuff, and he would he would talk about his, the structure of his day, uh-huh. and it was just unbelievable. Um, I I want this. It's on my list of things right now to make, but it's like he You've would read a- an hour of history in the morning, then oh, he'd take yeah. a walk, then he'd read an hour of philosophy, and then he'd write this, and he'd write for three hours, and then he'd take a small break, and then read an hour of you know fiction. Like he had yeah. this. It was like I was like ooh. Johnny, I'm no C.S. Lewis, but if I could do like five minutes of history, can I just can I just point out that C.S. Lewis didn't have TikTok? <laughs> it would have ruined. We him. don't know what would have happened. Could you Some imagine? Of these, can you imagine the philosophers in history? Oh. Like if if Plato had to be on Facebook, oh, would it have? You know, what I'm saying with the the it's like water hitting a rock. These comments that would have come in. Oh, actually, I believe human beings are not what they continually do they just are beings that exist on a temporal like whatever loser <laughs> like it would have they would have come at him so yeah. yeah and uh it would i wonder if it would have they would have uh, given in to the to unbearable the, weight of the online trolls yeah i'm glad they didn't have to put up with it frankly no it left their minds more although they if you you know read an acts that's that yeah that's true athens was a place where they spent all their time the yeah, bible right. says just sitting and talking about right. philosophies, you know, which is interesting to me. Like I sometimes think about how did they make money? Was there must've been uh, like a, a hierarchy yeah. for, for those who are privileged enough to be in the philosophical cast or whatever. Like, I guess that, how did they? Right. Well, even now you see that. I mean, I would say that now is like a, a college university is that you pay money to go sit around and think or learn to think deeply. Yeah. And then some people are just there to party or whatever, but there are people who are there and you get this elevated sense of yourself, but really it's a very privileged place to be. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. Not, people who have to go work, they don't get to sit around and be like, I wonder why we're even here though. It's like, your order's up. Like right. you have to go work. Yeah. So it's interesting. Uh, we talked about that last week about how like anxiety is kind of this thing that is a very modern concept as we know it anxiety as we know it angst as we know it sure well yeah thinking about the deeper existential parts of who you are you know andrew wilson uh, there's an amazing book called remaking the world how 1776 created the post-christian west i may have referenced it before yeah but he talks about the fact that it's the move from hunter gathering to farming yeah that actually creates the potential for in advancement in society because if you're hunter gathering like you just said that's what you have to do what is that called agrarian yeah but once it moves to agrarian then think about what happens now you can stay put Mm -hmm. wait for your crops and basically a group of people is doing that then they can store it for another period under hunter gathering you can't store as much you're always moving about chasing it now you can store it so you think about you're building buildings Mm -hmm. to store things and then eventually people can own more buildings than someone else. Mm-hmm. And now they can hire you to do the farming and the storing. And now they're just managing you. And eventually there becomes over the, the course of hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years, people who they're no longer touching the ground, but they now have the freedom to think about other things such as creating a road, you know, some sort of governing system for all these people who are all, you know, I mean, it's amazing. And then eventually, like you said, universities, I mean, if you could just go way down the line, there's somebody you you can sit around and their job is no longer to work the ground. It's to think about things. Or second guess the people that made the road. Yeah. Why do we even need roads? (laughs) You know, and they think they get to think they're deeper because they think those thoughts. That's the weird thing is like, I really am realizing that more and more now and I'm guilty of this. So I'm not saying it as though I'm above it. I think that modern culture is just people sitting around feeling superior to one another. Mm-hmm. Like uh, we talked about that today, how we kind of have a a quiet civil cold war happening, red states and blue states. Right. Like I'll talk to friends and I'll be like, I'm going to such and such city. I'm going to Chicago for a show. And then, you know, 20 years ago, they'd have been like, oh, the big city. Literally, like people take pride now in the fact that they are afraid of big cities or they hate big or cities. Or they hate a certain city, yeah, in yeah. particular, yeah. And I just go, that's such a strange, what a strange thing to build your personality around of like, 
the, you feel like, and they hate you too, by the way. Like if you live in, you know, whatever, central Illinois and you're a farmer, you're kind of trained to think that Chicago is where you go to get murdered. And so you get to... F- you get to feel like you're superior to them because you have the quiet, peaceful farm life. And they're trained to think that you're rednecks and hillbillies right. who know nothing but like growing things in the ground. And meanwhile, they're living this big, fast paced city life. They feel superior to you. And you just have this weird, civil, quiet, cold war happening. Yeah. That's okay. And that, But now it's boiling over. Like we're starting to see it, you know. It's just a strange thing. There's like an incendiary vibe that I'm getting from some of this now where it's like, all right, guys, we need to cool the temperature on some of this. Yeah. Like we're all Americans here. Like being afraid of a place or thinking you're superior to a place like has a limit to where it becomes like very uh, non-helpful. That's a really interesting um, thought process. In fact, that's worth, I think, revisiting, Johnny. Uh, oh. We just take a, a few moments to hear from a word. Wait, to hear a word. Oh. Multiple words, just, possibly, from okay. a few of our sponsors. <laughs>Yeah, I read an article somewhere and they were talking about, and I know this is a trigger word to even say the name, but they were talking about sort of the the populist, um, I guess, experiment that has now turned into this this long ranging change of what Trump's influence has been. And they were dialing it back to, you would think, and a lot of us think this is about um, liberal versus conservative, yeah. Democrat versus Republican, or even rich versus poor, mm-hmm. or even city versus agrarian. And and this social scientist took it even deeper and said the, the actual reason why, think about how so many um, maybe blue collar or agrarian working or people who own their own businesses, but they're, they're, they're hard at work every day, somehow feel this deep connection to a billionaire, right? Mm-hmm. That they think from from New York, yeah, right. The city that they hate, right? Who somehow represents their values? Right. Like, how did that happen? You know, and yeah. and this guy was saying that it's not really a matter of all those other things. It's a matter of um, I forget the exact words that he used, but it's a matter of elitism mm-hmm. versus pragmatism in that or pragmatism in that. I think it's a great new word. Pragmatism. pragmatism. Yeah, there it's we better. Go. One yeah. extra syllable. But you begin to, con- that's the thing you just laid out, but instead of making it about big, about location or geography, because now yeah. the, the new world geography means very little because we can all be anywhere on our phones anytime we want yeah, to. Yeah, right? yeah. Or we can jump on a plane. I can be on the other side of the country in no time. So it's sort of taken away some of those concrete elements of the division. And now if you really bring it down to ideology, mm-hmm. it's that it, when they, they really polled people, who they're really afraid of or who they really hate are those who think that they're either elitist and and not just, it's not just education, but that I have an enlightened viewpoint over you. And they trace this back even through world history versus those who says, no, I just get stuff done and I'm practical about Mm -hmm. what it needs. And they, they one feeling that the other is calling them ignorant or stupid or uneducated the other feeling that they're calling them mm-hmm. not street smart, unable to understand the real world or to get their hands dirty. And that that division between yeah. elitists and, and pragmatists is sort of where it really has happened in our country. Because think about it. The speeches are saying that they're right. telling you you're the hard worker. Right. The, the, this other group of people, they just want to sit around and take away what you have by just thinking that they're better. Yeah. Right. So it's that it's it's creating that suspicion based upon those dividing lines. Yeah. And the weird part is watching people just like you say, base something on an ideology or a belief of what is really happening. And then even if you show them something else, they'll double down. It's like it becomes so deeply entrenched, almost like a religious belief. Yeah. You know, you have faith in this thing. Uh, I find that odd on all sides to really like believe that deeply in a candidate or a person in government, like that you'd be like, this is my guy and I'm, he's my ride or die. Like, I just have never felt that way about any candidate. I'm just like, that's a government employee. Well, I don't, I don't feel that way. I would not put a flag of you in my yard. No, I would not wear a hat that says, you know, whatever make america driver again i don't know what it would be a mata mata (laughs) Uh, hamilton talked about that that the 
formula for what he called demigods, like or demagogues. I yeah. figure which one, which term he used. Being able to like affect democracy, and I'm speaking can happen from both parties or either yeah, side. Yeah. But being able to basically amass this like unwitting yet also completely loyal mm-hmm. group that will follow them, even to the point of questioning the very pillars of democracy that the country's been built on, mm-hmm. has to happen when they can convince them to be afraid. Like it has to be mass hysteria almost. And, yeah. and, and these are not the first politicians in history to do it. They were doing that no, in the late it, 1860s. It's, it's been happening for a long time. It, it, to, to me, the crazy thing is not that it still happens. It's that it still works. Yeah. Same with you see with grifting preachers. You know, I posted a thing today about Greg Locke and it's like he's now it's his new whatever his new punching bag is. And he's told people that like, if you bring Starbucks into my church, you know, I'm going to ask you to leave. And like he's and you're like, when is this guy going to preach about Jesus? I'm so confused. And I feel like we got to like, it's so odd. It's not, it's not that he said it. It's that a thousand people cheered when he said it. Right. That made me go, whoa, like, how does this guy still get a thousand people to even listen to him? Well, yeah, a lot more than a thousand. And I think yeah. that's the thing. It's not, you know, you and I had a conversation with, with somebody via email and. Oh, this is very mysterious. Yeah, I know it is. I can't say what it is. But, <laughs> but I said. Hey, there's things that you guys are saying that we don't necessarily disagree with. Yeah. We don't disagree with everything you're saying, but the emphasis that is being placed on it is not going to be the emphasis of what we want to do. Yeah. I think emphasis is as important sometimes as substance mm-hmm. because what we emphasize, no matter what we say is our true belief system, what we emphasize is our functional or practical belief system. And I think churches, and we had a conversation at our lunch at the Grove event this last Sunday, which is for new, you know, newer people to the church. And we talked about that, like, I'm not going against all denominations, but you're seeing a lot of denominations right now be, you know, broken apart into different factions and different things because they had to, they had to come into an emphasis upon something that was right. maybe ma- made them different than another right. eventually, denomination. Ev- or eventually somebody just calls the question, what right. do you really believe about this thing? And then that difference now suddenly becomes a big glaring thing. Right. They were trying to kind of mute it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's okay to like, you know, we believe in via media, the middle way Mm -hmm. that there's, that there's an unseen tension that I think we all call the question. That's modern society. Tell me which side you're on. Yeah. When I think that the ancients had a more, some of the ancients at least, you know, had a more contemplative way to say, I mean, I think a true wise person will say, you know what? I'm still working on that. I I can tell you where uh, I tend to light right now. Yeah. But, I don't know the fullness of that yet. And I'm going to have to, I do think it's interesting the way that we do. We talked about that too. Like the, the, what I would call Byzantine, really super overly, super complicated, ever narrowing purity that we're asked to live under, uh, by future generations. So in other words, we talked about being cringe last week. Everything you do, if you're taking a swing at something, is going to look cringe in 20 years. Yeah. That's how it works. Either just stop being afraid of create, just stop creating things because you're so afraid of looking cringe or stop believing, stop standing for anything. Stop having a position, having a take on something. That's really the only way to avoid. And that would be cringe down the road. Like it is interesting to me. I think the thing that's going to be uh, the big one for this generation is we're going to realize that technology destroyed us, not destroyed like, Skynet. I mean that it destroyed our brains. Yeah. Like I think that like Sadie's kids are going to be like, why did you give us a cell phone? Yeah. You know, from birth or whatever. Right. And she's going to have to be like, and I'm like, hold on, I'm getting another call. Exactly. Right. And like, bloop, you hit your temple. <laughs> yeah. But I think for real, they will be. There will be a backlash, almost like Luddite. It'll be a backlash yeah, against like, what did you do to us? And they'll be looked at with the same scorn that we're looked at for like, why did you have separate drinking fountains? Why did you, there's going to be a, so while they think they're the ever, you know, they're the evolved, whatever, what we're doing to our brains now with like going after likes and views and all the things that we do, it is changing us and changing our kids in such a way that I think that's going to be what the backlash of the next generation is going to be like, what did you do to us? In the same way, we ruined the housing market yeah. for the next generation, and they're all mad at us because now nobody can afford a house. 
Yeah. Because we all had to have five houses or whatever it was, you know. Yeah. We bought them at subprime mortgages and we ruined it. And to be clear, guys, I only have one house. John only has one house, but yeah. it's gigantic. But Johnny has five. Yes. Um, but you know what I'm saying? So like what 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 this generation is ruining is it's it's gonna be interesting to see there'll be a comeuppance, I think, for that. Yeah, I think there's gonna be a movement much like the anti smoking campaign. Huh. There's going to be a movement because that's a that's it's a, a drug. It really is a drug reaction that yeah. we're getting for these things. The dopamine response. I told my brother that because he goes, I can't sleep more than six hours at a time. He's a parent. You know, that's part of right. it. Is it just you get up or like stop you're smoking while you sleep? But it's, no, he was talking. We were talking about like, yeah, me for me, it's like six and a half hours. I'll wake up. And if I want to, if I can sleep longer, like I've got a late flight or I just have the day off. And I want to go back to sleep for a couple more hours. I have to tell myself, even though I'm awake for that five minutes in between, I have to tell myself, don't look at your phone. Yeah. Because if I if I if I turn on the dopamine, you're done. Discharge, it's going to make my brain wake up and then start thinking about problems or a text message I need to return. But then my brain goes into high gear if I don't pick up my phone. It goes, well, what if somebody texted you while you're asleep? Or what if you're missing yeah. an email? What if there's a booking request for a show? Like, and so then I'll reach for the phone. So you I, got phone mo. I do have phone mo. It is. It's go. a total phone mo. So I think, but that's something that a generation ago we wouldn't have no. thought about. And I just think if I could go, if I could go back and tell, but it's hard to tell somebody that. Like yeah. hold them, hold an account. That's what I mean is stop holding generate. Now there are things that other generations did that were wrong. I'm not saying that, but I just think like the technology th- question and giving AI just the wheel the way that this generation is doing it. Like, well, look, if AI can make Photoshops and perfect videos of the president doing ridiculous things and it'll amuse us, why not do it? Well, because it could cause World War III. Like, we're not thinking of that stuff. And I think the next generation is going to be like, what were you doing? I hope the next generation has that. Like, <laughs> yeah. I do feel that, yeah, we're in a little bit of a a, a moment of obviously technological a renaissance of sorts, you know? Yeah. But the, the idea that we are now, especially I think in American culture, so offended by boundaries. Boundaries are a threat to freedom for us. Mm-hmm. And I think that the freedom, what we think of as freedom, um, which, you know, Johnny, this is actually a great moment oh. for us to launch into a new, because I want to read a quote. Oh, because we got John's quote of the week segment yeah. that we launched last week. Did you find a new theme song or are you going to stick with it? What was the old one? Play the old one. Do you have the old one? Oh, you want me to play the old one? No, sure. They, they didn't go back last week and listen. It yeah, a, but I just want to give them the candidates. Because we're just kind of no, at, or, I don't. Because it'd be too hard to pull. Okay, in. we're so, interview, yeah, yeah. we're interviewing new candidates for John. Yeah, but I got one. I got one for this week. Uh, so this is going to be um, our our. Hold on one second, guys. This is going to be right now our uh, quote of the week. Hopefully, this one will work better. Okay. Mm-mm, I don't like it. It feels like uh, <laughs> it feels like you're in one of those like trendy restaurants, Johnny. I am. Uh, uh, that's what I feel. Or you're in an elevator at like a hotel that's trying really hard. Well, I mean, to be trendy. Do you think I was trying too hard? I, I think you, I think I'm in an elevator with you, and you're trying too hard. I get that a lot. William Hazlitt said, mm-hmm. "The love of liberty is the love of others. The love of power is the love of ourselves." Oh, wow. So what we think of as liberty, though, mm-hmm. is preserving the love of ourselves um, as opposed to the love of others. Because freedom, and this is actually for me a scriptural thing even, like real liberty is not the ability to do whatever you want. Yeah. It's the ability to not be controlled by the things you shouldn't do. Oh, okay. It's yeah. freedom from, not just freedom to. Oh, that's good. You yeah. know? And so, because to me, it's always like, we think of liberty, though, is only freedom to. Right. And Paul talks about that. He's like, hey, now that you've been set free, don't use your freedom to do this. Like, he said, you're free from this, so don't return to it. Right. Um, The big thing, and we could list all the sins, quote unquote, if we want to, but the big thing we're free from is, like, the, the slavery to only loving ourselves. That's why Jesus said, like, the actual best, the true commandment, the greatest commandment is to love others as you love yourself. Like... I'm freeing you from the love of self. Yeah. Not that I'm not mean the kind of love for self that knows yourself well so that you can, you know, grow and become self-actualized and healthy and emotionally healthy. I'm not talking about that. 
but it's it's like the obsession with keeping up with my freedom. Yeah. To the point that, and I'm I'm for freedom, everybody. I mean, let's let's be John clear. John is there. pro freedom, everybody. Yeah. I mean, I'm not an anti freedom guy. I think though, when I find that I want to cling to my freedoms to the detriment of anything else. Yeah. Like when it's the highest standard, then I've moved past what freedom and liberty is really intended to do. Like the, the, yeah. the society that if you want to just go civically or historically, the society that the founders were trying to envision mm -hmm. was one where we could coexist together and that multiple multiple needs or desires could be met in a way that was mutually beneficial yeah. to all involved. So it meant that you would, it, it meant compromise, right? right? It meant that I'll have to give something up, but we'll all gain something better right. through this because we'll, we'll share a value system and we'll share sort of a mission. I'm not saying that, I mean, I understand that's an idealized version of it and it's not ever functioned quite that way. Well, and they had no idea that there'd be people now that say expresso. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, if they had known that, they would have been like, that guy doesn't get freedom. Yeah, how could they How could they have known exactly? They, there's no way that the fan... Was that... Oh, was that the no, more, more bumper music for John's <laughs> Sorry. You guys didn't hear that. Only Johnny did. No, and, and I think I think that that's the... I think that's funny. They didn't know what they were... They did have people, though, who didn't certainly yeah. align with what they were wanting to align with at the time. But how did they coexist? Like, there was a, a, at least I'm a respect. Like, if they had known... Okay, I want freedom for everybody, whatever religion, but if you say for all intensive purposes, <laughs> you have to go to you another, have you have to go, go back to England. Back to yeah. Deutschland. You have to, you have to go back to England. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for all intensive purposes. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, Is that what you say? Do you no. say for all intents and purposes? No, I say intents and purposes for sure. So anyway, it's just something, Johnny, it's just food for thought. What's, what about calm, cool, and collective? That's one of my favorites too. Yeah. He's Study calm, collective. cool, and collective. Like he's a group of people. <laughs> <laughs> he has become a collective. Yeah. Well, no, it's just something to think about, Johnny. And It uh, is. And uh, that's good. Speaking of the past, No, John, well, just to remind you guys, that was the quote of the day. Oh. The, you're going to hit the bumper. <laughs> <laughs> So ridiculous. Come on, guys. What was that guy's name again? Uh, <laughs> William Henry. Uh, William Hazlitt. William Hazlitt. Yeah. Uh, well, John, let's go back this week in history. Uh, we do it every week, but I love doing it. It's a segment we like to call Talk About Then. John, this week, 1988, a very... Uh, Exciting thing happened on mm -hmm. the Oprah Winfrey show. 1988? 1988, November okay. 15th. TV host Oprah Winfrey had her highest rated episode ever for the show. Do you want to take a guess on what the show was about? Mm. 1988? Yeah. Uh, no. Help me. She displayed a wheelbarrow containing 67 pounds of fat to demonstrate how much oh. weight she had lost. It was the jeans. It was the, when she came out and goes, I did it. She had wow. been, on, she'd been on a juice fast, I think, if I remember correctly. Wow. And she, of course, she regained the weight, you know, uh, when she went off the juice fast. She's struggled with her weight many, many times, like many Americans and like myself. But I do remember that episode because it was, of course, I mean, she got the contracts with the slim, all the people. I mean, she had all the... It was amazing. You know, it was a wow. TV, it was a landmark television show. I can still remember the, and I don't, I'm not an Oprah guy. I just remember that. It was everywhere. So uh, anyway, congratulations. That's very interesting. And, and that became certainly a theme. Yeah. You know, but it, I think it, it, it hit the nerve or tapped into what we now see as a, a major dieting culture and fitness culture. Yeah. But certainly I think, right. you know, because I mean, Think about the history, the foods that built America, the foods that built America, and those kinds of things. Where we were at that point in time, not yeah. really paying attention to the yeah. carbohydrates and the calories and the portions. well, and back then too, it was fat. The fat that you eat makes you fat, right? Like every fat was bad fat, and right. And so people were like eating the snack whales cookies that were just loaded with sugar and everything. Mm -hmm. They're like, but these are fat these free. Are fat. I can have a whole sleeve of fig newtons, right? All right. Anyway, uh, I was there. I was right there with them. Eating my sleeve of Fig Newtons. <laughs> I didn't keep the weight off either. Uh, John, this week, speaking of which, 1969, 
Dave Thomas opens his first Wendy's hamburger restaurant. Oh, wow. Uh, located in Columbus, Ohio, quickly becoming known for its square beef patties and frosty milkshakes. Thomas named the restaurant after, do you know? His daughter. His fourth child, Melinda Lou Wendy Thomas. Mm. Her, how, do, how does Melinda Lou it's a turn into of... Wendy? No, it's the Wendy was in quotes. How does Melinda Lou become Wendy you Thomas? sure it wasn't Wellinda Lou? No. Okay. It was not Wellinda Lou, <laughs> which sounds like a Buddy Holly song. <laughs> Wellinda Lou. Okay. Uh, her likeness was used as the young freckle-faced girl on the Wendy's. I think he later said that he regretted it because he thought it was like this homage to his daughter, and he didn't realize like she's going to get teased. She's going to like yeah. he's kind of locked her in forevermore or as this little girl. Yeah, yeah, it's a little bit odd to do to a child who now goes on to be an adult. And I think she ended up working for the company, but it was like she's. It's it's a strange thing, right? Yeah. You've made them a brand. She became the CEO, I'm pretty certain. Yeah, I yeah. think you're right. Uh, it's jokes on everybody else because she's doing okay. John, this week, 1990, it is revealed by the producer that Millie Vanilli did not perform on the album Girl, You Know It's True, which won the Grammy for Best New Artist weeks earlier. The Grammy was later revoked. Millie Vanilli consisted of Rob Pilatus and Fabrice Fab Morvan. Uh, <laughs> Wendy Morvan. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, Fabrice. You can call me Wendy. Uh, they had been one of the most popular pop acts of the late 1980s and early 1990s, with millions of records sold. Do you remember the? Do you remember where you were when you realized Millie Vanilli were lip syncing? You know, you're gonna laugh at me, but for some reason, I thought the lip syncing was only alive. I didn't realize they lip synced an album. Oh yeah, no, they never sang. How do you lip sync an album? That well, just means you... you just got another singer to do no, it. Yeah, they they didn't lip sync. Uh, they. Well, they, they didn't perform on the album. The lip syncing was what they had to do live because they basically, if you ever heard them speak, they almost had like German accents. Yeah. They had very thick European accents. And so they'd be like, yes, we're very proud of the music. And then they go, girl, you know. And it was, you go, okay, this is not the same guy. Yeah. But, but sometimes uh, the accent goes away during. That's true. Yeah. That happens. The Yeah. But they, they, yeah, they, it was kind of the guy, I think one of the producers came out or somebody did an expose. Obviously there was one famous concert where the record skipped uh -huh. and, uh, that'll do it. That'll, yeah. Yeah. You know, 10,000 people are like, wait a minute. I'm great with backtracks. I'm great with like, we just watched the Taylor Swift movie. It's interesting how it's come around now. People like use loops and use backing tracks and it's not, it's not a career no. killer. No. It's our, our, our standard of what is selling out or what is, uh, culturally okay is different now i remember thinking like that in ads too like when you watch a commercial you wouldn't want to like if you're a famous actor you're john goodman you know you're on the number one show you're on roseanne you wouldn't go hawk honda civics right that would be selling out now it's not no. you hear you know the back in you know 20 years ago you'd hear the voice you go i think that's john goodman's voice right. from lowe's now it's just like he's, he's just like, wearing an apron. Yeah, now it's just right. like I'm John Goodman and I shop at Lowe's. Yeah. And like nobody cares. Yeah. Nobody cares at all. They're just like, go get your bag, John Goodman. <laughs> yeah, like I see Stanley and Phyllis on the Cheerios commercials now in their robes <laughs> yeah. sitting at a table. Mm -hmm. and you're like, that was the it's most. It's weird seeing Stanley with that big hair. You know, he's got like yeah. a taller hair than he had on the office. And you're like, that's weird. It looks yeah. like a wig almost. And I don't know. They're kind of playing their characters. Yeah. And they're kind of not. Yeah, I wonder if there's any weird, like, the office people have to get involved and be like, hey, you know, you can't be Stanley on this commercial. Right. You owe us half this money. <laughs> uh, I don't know how we got there from Millie Vanilli, but we did. Uh, Johnny, we have a way. Did you like uh, Millie Vanilli? That I did. did were, you, were you let down by them when you found this out? You were like, they're not real? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it was like a major it wasn't crisis. a crushing right. moment for you? I was in the middle of other probably emotional crises at that. What was the year? It was 1990. Yeah, I think I was smack dab and starting uh, middle school yeah or maybe sixth grade at that time so yeah getting your trapper keeper together and such uh, would have been which would have had millie vanilli on it trying maybe. to iron out my parachute pants you know what i'm saying man those will melt you gotta that's a cool yeah. setting don't put a rayon shirt mm -hmm. on an iron or that vice is a versa. very cool setting yeah um finally john william murdoch died this week 1839 he was a scottish inventor he invented the oscillating steam engine 1784. He also made the first practical use of gas lighting. Huh. And what I want to say to that is, or did he? <laughs> or did we? Is that all in your head? That's great. Uh, 
Or are you sure it's not your fault that he did that? I because I you're the crazy one. I thought right. William Murdoch invented gaslighting. There we go. That's guys. We call that a. We, I don't know what we call it. A more we'll call joke, it, we joke call, inception. We call that a reach. Yeah, that's a. <laughs> that's a. We call that a bad ending to the show, but nobody cares. If you're still listening, listeners. We thank you so much. You can go to talkaboutthatpodcast.com. Oh. Find all of our archives. A episodes. delightful site, by the way. Click at the top right. Mm-hmm. You can support the show, get ad-free yeah. content. Click at the bottom right. That's how you send us a note. We got so we get so many cool notes and emails from our listeners yeah. talking about things that they enjoyed about the show, asking us questions, things they want us to hear us talk about. We love that. Yeah. If you go to the iTunes page or wherever you get your Pine podcast, leave a five-star review and uh, write a review. That helps people find the show. Yeah. Yeah, and that ad-free content is for our patrons. So thank, thanks again. Thanks. <laughs> thanks, thanks, thanks. Thanks, patrons. Thanks again to all of our patrons for all that you do for us every month. It means a lot to us. And uh, you guys should check out Johnny's website because the man is traveling like a house of fire. And shows South Georgia people. I'm coming to Perry, which I didn't know where it was, but it's uh, somewhere south. Can you spell uh, that? Is that P-E-R-R-Y? Okay. Like the band Perry? I thought it was like P- Paris, but pronounced Perry. Perry. Like, oh. Perry, Georgia. I'm at the Muse Theater with my buddy Ed Wiley, who's mm. a friend of the show. Oh, that's great. And uh, we're going to be doing a show there one night only, and that is November 29th. Wow. Get your tickets, johnnyw.com. You've been hanging out with your family for Thanksgiving, and you're like, you know what? I want a break. Yes. Let's go a comedy break, if you will. Oh, and I have the same kind of show coming up at Zany's Comedy Club December 27th. It so truly is the week that of ride is, yeah. Yeah, or the week of Christmas, mm. December 27th. Oh, you said December. Yeah. November okay. 29th, December 27th. So I it's can't. kind of the same thing. The holiday weekends where you're like... Whew, that's enough already. And you're Uncle thinking, Lou. man, if these guys can't keep up with the dates, how would I? And the answer is J-O-N-N-I-E-W.com. Right. Go to Amazon.com, search for John Driver, find all of his literary works. Yeah, and if you see... A cavalcade. Um, yeah, wow, I mean, nice. If you see a Mennonite theologian, that's yeah. not me. But I mean, you might want to still... He's, maybe, he's maybe you get super both. smart, yeah. Y'all should bundle your books together. That'd be and just, great. You know? Yeah. A little kickback. I'm be, Do Amish people take kickbacks? That feels like it's a little he's bit He's a Mennonite, anti- number one. Okay. Wow. Mennonite. Sorry. I guess. <laughs> I didn't mean to lump everybody in with a. <laughs> I'm not going to say anything else. So uh, Those are your words. Wait, I'm, now I'm gaslighting. <laughs> now I invented gaslighting. Okay. Hey, guys, thanks so much for the time you gave us this week. Man, let's do it again next week on Talk About That. Talk About That.